Father, I pray now uh, that as we reflect on these things, uh, aspects of our life, your desire to help us to live life to the full, that you would be with us, that you would open our minds and our hearts, that you would show us your ways and your purposes. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. There's a story about uh, two men who were uh, shipwrecked on an island, and it was just the two of them. And one of them was terribly upset and, and uh, was anxious, and, and, uh, and the other was quite relaxed and calm and, and not at all worried. And the one who was very upset said, how can you be, how can you take it easy? How can you, we are, we are trapped, we are stranded, no one will find us forever. We're going to die here. And the other one said, relax. He said, I'm a Christian. I go to a church. I tithe a hundred pounds a week. My pastor will find me. This is today in a, in a series of th important things is what my father used to call the Sermon on the Amount. Uh, and I can still remember, I must have been eight or nine years old and it was in Northern California. We were traveling, not quite sure what we were doing at the time, but I can remember visiting friends and going to church with them. And when my father came out after we'd been in church for an hour or so, came out and said, boy, we timed that one wrong. We managed to hit the annual Sermon on the Amount. And somehow or another, that stuck with me. I have no idea what the pastor said, but I know what he was talking about. I can remember perfectly that we went to lunch and in the lunch place, uh, there was a, a big container uh, which had live lobsters in it. I was fascinated by the lobsters and I can remember everything about the lunch and I can remember absolutely nothing about the sermon. I hope this may not be quite the same. Money is something we don't talk very much about, uh, particularly uh, the British side of my body uh, doesn't like to say anything about money at all because it's really not very polite. We don't talk about politics, except we sort of do. We don't really talk about sex and we don't talk about money. At least that's what I was brought up uh, thinking. But in fact, Jesus talks quite a lot. And so does the Bible about money and things. Uh, in the New Testament, 16 of the 38 parables that Jesus told were about money. One out of 10 verses in the Gospels is about money or possessions. 500 times in the New Testament, uh, prayer is, is discussed or talked about or mentioned. 500 times faith is talked about or mentioned. And 2,000 times money and possessions are talked about. So it, it features heavily uh, in the life in the Bible. And I think that's probably true also in our lives, even if we don't talk very much about it. Uh, money is necessary, it's important, uh, and uh, sometimes we know how to deal with it and sometimes we don't. The reading from the first reading from this morning from Malachi is quite interesting because it's full of questions. They, it's clear that God speaking through the prophet Malachi to the people of Israel at that time, the people of Israel did not understand. They wanted God to bless them and they couldn't understand why they weren't being blessed. And he was saying, it's on you. It's your fault, your problem. It is being, the problem is being created by yourselves. And they said, how, how can this be? We're not intending to do that. We don't want to cause ourselves harm. And he says, well, you're, you're stealing from me. And they, and they look horrified and they say, how, we, we're not stealing from you. How are we stealing from you? And he says, in tithes and offerings. Now understand that a tithe literally the, the word tithe, the, the old word means 10%. And, and the Jewish people at that time 
were this was a time when God tried to teach us and bring us into uh, a healthy life by means of rules, because that's what they listened to. So they had the Ten Commandments and so forth. And one of the rules was that the first fruits, 10% of what you created, what you made, what you earned, what you grew, was brought into the church. It was put in the storehouses, and it was used uh, basically as a social, social system to be able to look after those who were less fortunate. Uh, it also took care of the priests and it took care of the costs of running the temple or the, or the synagogue or, or whatever. And that was the system that exists. And obviously the people in Malachi's time had fallen out of, of doing that and maybe even of understanding it. And God is calling them back and he's saying the reason that you are not thriving is because you are not following the rules. Uh, I've set a system up. If you follow the system, do this stuff, it will go well with you. And then he says, I know you don't understand this. Give it a shot. Try me and see if this doesn't happen. I know money is, is difficult. I know that it's an important part of your life. If you'll just test me, you will see that I know better than you know in this regard. So that's basically what the passage is saying. And, and it's clear that God wants to bless them. Then the nations will call you blessed for years will be a delightful land, he says. But like them, we don't really often understand God's economy and his system. So I want to I want to begin today and see if I can go through and explain it to us. And then we're going to look at the second passage briefly. And here's the deal. Here's what God has set up or had set up at that time and probably is, is the foundations of what he expects of us now. He says, essentially, I want relationship with you. I love you. I created you. I built you for relationship with me. I've called you and I want us to be close. And I want you to be fully as I've made you to be. So I want you to be productive. I want you to receive the fruit of that productivity. I want you to feel good about yourself. I want you to help the people around you. You haven't got everything. They haven't got everything. But between you, you will have everything. And this is the sort of symbiotic relationship that I want for you with each other and with me. And he says, here's how the economy is going to work. You come to me and tell me what you need. Because I want you to recognize that I am the source of all the stuff. All the cattle on a thousand hills are mine. I created all of this stuff and I can create it. Uh, I created it out of nothing and I can create more of it out of nothing. Essentially, I am your provider. In fact, in the Old Testament, his name is Jehovah Jireh, I, the, our Lord God, the provider. I want you to recognize that and look to me and then be grateful for it as part of our relationship. I don't want you to have to worry about money all the time. I don't want you to have to think that you have to do it on your own. We're in this together and it will build our relationship this is how it's supposed to work. He says that in the Lord's Prayer, in the, in the New Testament, he, uh, he says, uh, Jesus teaches his disciples, give us today our daily bread. So here's the deal. We need to recognize that everything that we need and probably most of what we want comes from God. And we need to ask him for it. We need to recognize what that is and we need to ask him for it. So. We need to say, Lord, today, I need 10 euros. Would you please give me 10 euros? Provide that for me. Or this month, I need 100 euros or whatever. I need 10 euros because I need to send my children to school. I need 10 euros because I need food on the table. I need 
10 euros because I have to put gas in the car. I need 10 euros because I'm saving for this trip, this holiday that we're going to take together. I need 10 euros because I want to bless my neighbor who just lost a chicken. I need 10 euros and so forth. We need to take the things that we need and put them before God and ask him to look after us in that way. 10 euros. And God says, I hear you. And I will do that because I love you and I will provide what you need. In fact, I'm going to provide you more than what you need. So here's your 10 euros and here's a bit more. Now, the bit more is not your money, it's, it's actually my money, but I want you to hold it for me. This is your money, you can spend it as you want, you can fulfill your needs with it, you could give it away, you can do whatever you want to do with it, but this is actually my money. And here's what I want you to do with this. In order that you know, and I know, that this is your money and it came from me, I want you to take this and I want you to give it back to me. I want you to take it in your hands, put it in your possession, and then return it to me. Now, I know you're returning my money, he says, but this way, I will know that you know where it came from. This way, I will know that you trust me for this, not just in your words or your thinking or your understanding, but in your deeds. So, because I also know that once you have this, the temptation will be to think that 11 euros is yours. Now, I might in fact give you this. Get it right way up. I might give you 15 euros. But remember, of that 15, one of those is mine. And we'll talk about and see what we do with the other four. Maybe you should save it for later when times are hard. Maybe you should give it away. Maybe you should do something that your heart wants to do with it for somebody else. This is yours to make sure you have enough. This is yours to make sure you don't worry but remember that this is mine. You can't give it away and call it yours. You can't spend it on you. Well, you can, but that would be a breach of trust. And you see, all of this is about building relationship. It's not just about feeding you, but it's about the relationship, which is based on a, on a foundation of trust. I trust that God will provide for me and he trusts that I will recognize it came from him. And I will recognize that by giving him the tithe and maybe more if I feel like it, I want to celebrate. And so I will give him some more or I'll give the other guy who seems to be shorted out a little bit. And maybe that's part of how God wants to provide for the other guy. And so it's a little complex, but the basics of it are, 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 are fairly straightforward. And, uh, the, the Jewish people in Malachi's time had forgotten about this. And so they, they weren't trusting God. They weren't recognizing where it all came from. They weren't honoring, and therefore it was falling apart. Now, recognize that it's God's slightly more sophisticated than that because he takes this and he does good with it. This supports the church, the temple, uh, the, the, the synagogue, the, the whatever. This is what pays for your priest. What, it's what enables the church to be able to give charitably in other places and to be able to help others. It's what lets the gospel go out for missionaries and so forth. This is part of the, God's economy. It's, it's how he funds um, that aspect uh, of our world. And if this isn't given, 
that doesn't happen. Now, of course he can create it, the cattle on a thousand hills are his, he can create it out of, but he, what he loses is the trust and the relationship aspect when he has to do it the other way. And so he longs for us to be in mutual relationship and interdependence with one another and with him. That's the basic concept. Now, what gets in the way of that? Well, things do get in the way of that. And they obviously had in Malachi's time. And that's what um, Jesus is talking about here when he's, when he's teaching in the New Testament. There are barriers. There's ignorance. We don't, we don't understand it. We don't know it. No one's taught us the basics of tithing and, and giving and so forth. Uh, we have a hardness of heart. Uh, we're greedy. Sin gets in the way of everything uh, and lots of things. We're afraid. We don't trust God that he will really take care of us. Uh, and it's, uh, and so it becomes the money part gets in the way. And it doesn't, not only do we fail to build the relationship and the trust with God, but it, it actually gets in the way and guilt gets in there and all sorts of things happen. And it's a, it's a terrible thing. I can remember uh, thinking this was all fairly nonsensical when I was fairly young. Uh, and my father taught this to me. Uh, and he, he, he did that with the allowance. I had an allowance. Uh, when I heard the Sermon on the Amount, I was nine years old. I really wasn't worried about money because I got not very much, but I got a certain amount of money every, uh, every month. And that seemed to be enough. And so I knew my dad took care of me. He was going to cover the bills or he was going to, I was going to get the sweets or whatever else was in, involved in that. And I think I have probably from the time I came back to the Lord and to church, um, Linda and I have always tithed, even when it was impossible. Uh, and we, or we thought it was impossible and we had no money whatsoever. We were in law school or something else of, of that nature, but God always made a way for us to be able to do that. I have to say, it. but God also uses sometimes money and our giving to do other things, which are extraordinary. For instance, uh, at the first time in my life where I had more money than I needed. I was working uh, as an international lawyer. I was actually working as a corporate executive uh, and we were building a, a plant in South Africa, but we were designing it uh, in The Hague. Sorry, we, um, we were not doing it in South Africa at that stage. We were, we were building a, a refinery expansion in, in Rotterdam and we were living in The Hague in the, and our main office was in um, Amsterdam in Harlem. And um, we had invited, we, we had a lovely house in The Hague and we had invited a, a Czechoslovakian, what was then Czechoslovakian co uh, couple to come and live with us. They were refugees. Uh, they escaped across the Iron Curtain at that stage and they had two small children, Lucien and Maud and their children's name were Dominique and Victoria. And, uh, and they came and we had this old Dutch Heron Hrat and they uh, they lived in the top floor of that and shared facilities with us all the way through it for a couple of years. And when we left there, we had plenty of money in the bank and life was good. And we wanted to leave them a bank account. And I didn't know how much we should put in the bank account for them. They were not yet legal in Holland, although they were about to be in a few months. We had helped them re attain legal immigrant status. They had been refugees uh, and we didn't want them penniless. They couldn't get, they couldn't get work uh, until they received that status. So I came up with a number and I said, Linda, what do you think? And here was this number. And Linda came up um, and she prayed about it. And she said, I, I actually have another number. And she gave me in that number. And we thought about it. And then we looked at each other and smiled and we put the two numbers together. And um, we, uh, we, gave, we put, set up a bank account for them and put that in there. So we gave them 
a larger amount than either of us thought we probably needed to, which was good. Within, uh, within and we, but we weren't sure it was the right amount and we didn't know what God was wanting to do. It was generous, but was it enough? Was it too much? Have we got this wrong? And I, uh, we were praying about it. And uh, within a week, my office manager uh, came to me and we were, we were leaving shortly thereafter. So we had to leave them enough to live on, on their own and uh, pay rent and get food and so forth. And uh, the, my office manager came to me and said, um, I, I know you, we haven't talked about this, but uh, the, the package that you're on provides a repatriation amount. And I also noticed in the course of that, that your, what, what we were given at that time was a tax equalization amount. You'd never applied for that over the last three years. And therefore I put it in for you. And so here's a check for this, very large amount of money, and uh, which I was was totally unexpected. I had no idea it was coming whatsoever. And he just beamed at me and, and said, "You know, Merry Christmas." And uh, and I looked at it, and it was very close to the amount uh, that we had put in Lucien Amount's bank account. And I thought, well, there's affirmation. But why is it uh, thirty? Um, can't remember what we used in Holland in those days, but whatever the, 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 the financial was, it euros, let's say, but it was at 30 and a bit euros off. And I couldn't figure that out. Uh, <laughs> and then it came to me that we had had our last meal with him, unless you think we were terribly cheap. We, we took the McDonald's, but that was because that was the children's favorite place to go. So we took them out for our last meal and we all had a great McDonald's meal. And right down to the, to the happy meal bits that came with it, the money that the, the check that we had received was the exact amount we had put in their bank account plus the cost of the McDonald's meal to the penny. And we knew that God was using that money, not just to support us and support Mount and Lucien, but he was wanting us to know that we got it right. Uh, and, that this, and to affirm us and to encourage us. That's what God does with money. He does all sorts of amazing and wonderful things if we let him and we recognize it. Now, what Jesus says here is what needs to rule our lives is our relationship with God, is our trust in him, which is built by this economic system and other things, but we need to allow him to be first in our lives. And if we're seeking to get the money to survive, it's not a bad thing, but it gets in the way of the relationship with him. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. He knows all this stuff. He sees all of it. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. If you're protecting your retirement, if you're protecting your holiday money, if you're protecting even the next meal, and you're not trusting God for these things, then you will be the last and so will everybody around you. You cannot serve both God and money, and it is more than sufficient to serve God and let him serve us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you love us so much, so much that you want to take care of everything. You want us to be in full partnership with you in our lives. You want to be excited when we're excited and you want to grieve with us when we grieve and you want to supply the essence of what we need. Maybe not all what we want, but the essence of what we need. And that through that, we will be doing it for each other even as we're doing it with you. And so Father, we pray that you'd show us in our lives and in our hearts how we can do that and be that. In the name of Christ, amen.